Hello and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Laura. I'm Kate. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. Today, we're discussing The Remains of the Day by Kazuro Ishiguro, a modern classic that may or may not have become overshadowed by the film starring Anthony Hopkins. What did my book club make of this Booker Prize winning novel? Did it live up to their high expectations? Did they love it or loathe it? And what did Kate and I think? Well, keep listening to find out. We finish, as always, with some more recommendations for your next book club read. Hello, Kate. Hi. Happy summer day on the other side of the world. Yeah, kind of slightly feels like a summer book. I don't know why remains of the day. I suppose, you know, summer, it's so ephemeral, isn't it? And then the autumn comes. <laughs> oh, well, it also feels as if he's traveling through a very verdant green England, which may well speak to June. Maybe it is of that period. Even the sudden rainstorm that comes down on the Rose Hotel in the final scenes reminds me of an English summer. Yeah, it's interesting you pick up on that, actually. Stuart in my book club, one of his things that he really loved about this book, he said there's a romance in it with the era. It's set in the 1950s, isn't it? The countryside, the ale, the tea in the tea rooms, this idea of Englishness. And summer, you know, when England, especially after what has felt like the most relentlessly cold, rainy spring, suddenly bursts into summer. And all English people just go nuts because we're not used to it. I always think it's the good thing about (laughs) us. We do really appreciate it when we get a bit of sun. But it is that point. You're just thinking, yes, England. There's nowhere you'd rather be. There's something about that transition that is really magical. But we get ahead of ourselves. Yeah. (laughs) I have to say, I am having to cast my mind back because we did it a little while ago, my book club. But I always think that's not such a bad thing because it's quite good to think about what stays with you. What do you remember about the book? But we should tell people what it's about, shouldn't we? It concerns mm. a butler. His name is Stevens. And he works in this very grand stately home called Darlington Hall for Lord Darlington. And he is reflecting back on his life and his career, the heyday of the house when it had a staff of 28 and his employer was managing a series of conferences trying to get involved in politics with Germany and the UK and trying to involve himself in the negotiations that were going on behind the scenes as the British government attempted to avert war. It was the appeasement policy, wasn't it? That's what they were trying to do. Mm. So he's looking back on these years of, as he sees it, being at the centre of the important political events of the day. And he's also talking about his daily life and his work and how important the idea of service is to him. This is the dominating thing about this character, Stevens, is that he has dedicated his life to being the perfect servant and reflecting himself on what that means to be a servant, to perform that role, whether he's done it well. And then the specific contemporary event that's happening is that he has received a letter from Miss Kenton, who was the housekeeper back in the day. And she's been gone for a long time. She left the house. And he reads into this letter a certain sense that perhaps she might be willing to come back and work at the house again. And he is understaffed because the house is now owned by this wealthy American who has quite a different idea about how to do things and thinks that the house that was once run with 28 members of staff can now be run with four. And so he ostensibly is interested in seeing if she would be willing to come back and work at the house again and help him out. But underneath, quite quickly, you realise that there is something going on, that there is an attachment there that he's interested in pursuing, even as he's not quite able to acknowledge it to himself. Mm. I would have said this is quite a simple book, but I feel like I've just made quite a meal of summing it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the back and forth. And then just to circle around to the English countryside again, he is writing down his thoughts and his experiences as he goes on this journey from somewhere near Salisbury. I think that's where Darlington Hall is. And he's traveling all the way down to Cornwall. He's talking about the West Country, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, that's a long journey on the freeways of today. But back then, it was three, four days, I think, of driving. And so he's stopping off along the way. And it's never explicit that he's writing in a diary. 
but he quite evidently is because he pauses at different moments and picks up the narration depending on what has happened up to that point in the day. So it's very clear. But there are lots of subtleties like that where nothing's quite spelled out. One of the things that almost everyone in my book club commented on and really, really enjoyed is the writing. The quality of the writing, the sense that you feel in such totally assured hands. So this might be a good moment to hear a clip. This is the Audible version and it's read by Dominic West. The fact is, over the past few months, I've been responsible for a series of small errors in the carrying out of my duties. I should say that these errors have all been without exception quite trivial in themselves. Nevertheless, I think you will understand that to one not accustomed to committing such errors, this development was rather disturbing, and I did in fact begin to entertain all sorts of alarmist theories as to their cause. As so often occurs in these situations, I had become blind to the obvious. That is, until my pondering over the implications of Miss Kenton's letter finally opened my eyes to the simple truth, that these small errors of recent months have derived from nothing more sinister than a faulty staff plan. It is, of course, the responsibility of every butler to devote his utmost care in the devising of a staff plan. Who knows how many quarrels, false accusations, unnecessary dismissals, how many promising careers cut short can be attributed to a butler's slovenliness at the stage of drawing up the staff plan. Indeed, I can say I am in agreement with those who say that the ability to draw up a good staff plan is the cornerstone of any decent butler's skills. Do you know, one of the problems with this book for me was that I couldn't help but see, even though I have never seen the film, but I couldn't help but see Anthony Hopkins as this character Stevens. I think if I'd had Dominic West in my mind's eye, I might have um, been more engaged with it. Shall we say that I was? <laughs> you know, this extremely attractive man. <laughs> not he that would Anthony not Hopkins... be the right fit. <laughs> Do you not think? Oh, it's so, that's interesting. He's far too young as well. It was one of the things that came up was whether, in fact, he couldn't help but feel it was just a shame that I hadn't been able to come to this book and come up with my own idea of what these characters were like. Because even though I've never seen the film, just knowing that Anthony Hopkins plays Stevens and Emma Thompson plays Miss Kenton, you can't help but see those, which for me was a bit of a shame. Amazing, though, the power of that film, even not having seen it, it was vivid in my <laughs> mind's eye. I'm just going to wade back into your point that everyone loved the writing and felt it was so self-assured. I find it so dull. <laughs> it's as if Ishiguro has never heard of a short sentence. <laughs> and I think that's very reflective of this character, who I'm sure would always write and think in fully formed, multi-clause sentences. But for me, it makes for very, very slow reading. I once picked this up back in my early 20s, probably, when I was first living in London. And I remember, I think I got to the car. So there's musings for about 15 to 20 pages. And then he sets out in his employer's Ford car, which is very fancy for the time. And that's where I left off because I was bored. You weren't hooked. I was not hooked. And in this case, you know, I had a commitment for book club. I am older, maybe wiser. I did enjoy it more, but I still am always a little bit surprised that Ishiguro has won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Mm, and the Booker Prize for this, of course. I can see the Booker Prize, but the Nobel Prize, <laughs> that's a big deal. But who am I to judge? I haven't exactly. read his other novels. No, exactly. Because this is what I feel. To make those kinds of statements, you just have to have read everything. And I've only read, I think I've read two or three of his. Maria in my book club was with you on this. She grumbled that she kept falling asleep every two or three pages. She just genuinely <laughs> found she couldn't stay awake. <laughs> Which isn't to say that she didn't get something from it. But yeah, that was kind of an issue for her. There's a quote in the opening pages of my edition, you know, when there's praise. The quote is actually from Doris Lessing. And she says, the writer is an original and so is the book, which is very funny and one of the saddest I can remember. And I read that quite early on and it was very helpful because I was like, oh, it is funny. Oh, OK. <laughs> That's there. All right. I'm allowed to read into that. It's meant to be funny. And it is funny at moments. There's a setup where, for example, Lord Darlington. No, actually, it's a guest, isn't it? Who's come with one of these gatherings of the great and the good. And for some reason, he asks Stevens. No, it is Lord Darlington, isn't it? Lord Darlington asks Stevens. I think the Stevens friend asks he can Lord Darlington, who asks Stevens. To explain to this young chap who's come 
about the birds and the bees, about sex, basically. And Stevens can't say no to anything. And of course, also like seizes on every task with his selfless dedication to duty. And so there are some quite amusing scenes where he's trying to just bring it up. <laughs> and there's also a kind of running theme about his inability to engage in what he calls banter. So the new yeah. owner of the hall, this American, is much more relaxed, quite free and easy. And you do really vividly get the sense of this relatively normal person coming in and this incredibly rigid, formal butler with all these ideas about propriety and the way things should be done. And I think the new owner is trying to loosen him up a bit, really. And Stevens does dawn on him that a certain response is expected of him. And he does his best, but he never quite to manages to pull it off. And that's what he's musing on at the end, where it really becomes tragicomic, because he's just had this incredible, hmm, how, we don't want to give everything away, no, right? But because the one tiny thing I would say that you do have pulling you through is there's a slight sense of, well, what's going to happen? Because the whole journey he is driving to meet Miss Kenton. And you have a very slight sense of anticipation about, well, what's going to happen when he gets there? Well, you know, to be honest, I was about halfway through this book. I thought, you know what? Judging by what I've read so far, I'm pretty sure that it's going to be underwhelming when he does finally meet her and probably nothing will happen. So even that like slight hook was like, you know what? I don't think it's going to work out. I don't think anything good is going to happen at the end of this. But I'm not giving anything away when I say that the final pages, his reflections turn back to bantering, that this is the thing that he needs to accomplish really on behalf of his employer in order to be the butler of the future. It's both funny and incredibly sad. I'm being a little bit flippant here, but if listeners tuned into our last bookshelf episode where we discussed The Midnight Library by Matt Haig, I do feel like The Remains of the Day is the literary equivalent. It's all about regret and what could have been. It is, and I think I would argue that it is beautifully written and that he does something very clever in a way because it's deceptively simple. And yet in every line, in every paragraph, there are things packed in there that resonate with you. I mean, I think all of us, and particularly I did wonder to myself whether this is one of those books that you're going to appreciate more and more and more the older you get. You know, all of us look back at who we once were, decisions we made, paths we might have taken, or perhaps this is a thing to say, actually, for any of our younger listeners out there, because I know that there are some. This is something that happens to you. This is how you know you're getting older, because instead of just always thinking about the next thing, suddenly you start looking back and thinking, oh, I wonder what would have happened if I'd done that. Of course, I'll never know now because you know that those opportunities have gone and they're not going to come back again. You made a choice. You moved on. And the river of time only goes one way. He creates these characters that you care about. And it's just then loaded with this really beautiful meditation on time and character and the things that make people who they are. There's a lovely explanation of why Stevens is the way he is. You know, he didn't just suddenly turn up in this persona of this incredibly rigid man whose only thought is of serving his Lord. I perhaps haven't explained to people, but one of the key examples of this is that his father, who previously was butler before him, and is still in service in the house in a lesser role now, collapses and he has a stroke and he's taken upstairs into one of the bedrooms and everyone knows it's the end. Stevens knows. And yet he is not able to go because he feels he needs to be on hand in the drawing room in case any of the guests need him for anything. And that gives you the sheer level of his self-effacement. He won't take anything for himself. And that his relationship with his father is this one where he feels his father would understand and approve of this choice. Do we ever learn about his mother? Isn't it just she's sort of dispatched quite early on? Is she? I, she's definitely I, not I, in the I, picture. If she, is, if she is, I missed it. Yeah. Good question. But it just felt like a key question to me is that we're told about his father, but we're never told about his mother or I missed it because maybe it was a sentence or two. We don't get a lot of his personal history. We also don't know if he served in World War I, presumably not, but we don't know why that would have been when he would have been a young man at that stage. So I had question marks there too. It's a first person narration. So he doesn't feel inclined to tell us things that he knows himself if it's not relevant to his current thinking. But it did feel like omissions. I'm sure very conscious and purposeful omissions by Ishiguro because his writing is nothing if not considered and controlled. Yeah, every word. Yeah, good question. I'm flipping through back to the beginning and it's true that where he introduces the idea of the father and talking about him, he doesn't mention the mother. Hmm. Mm, ah, right. Okay, here we go. I am one of two brothers. My elder brother Leonard was killed during the South African War while I was still a boy. 
Naturally, my father would have felt this loss keenly, but to make matters worse than the usual comfort a father has in these situations, that is, the notion that his son gave his life gloriously for king and country, was sullied by the fact that my brother had perished in a particularly infamous manoeuvre. Well, not only was it alleged that the manoeuvre had been a most un-British attack on civilian Boer settlements, overwhelming evidence emerged that it had been irresponsibly commanded with several floutings of elementary military precautions so that the men who had died, my brother among them, had died quite needlessly. And so it goes into another theme, which is the idea of the establishment. And mm. if we don't question, if we just blindly follow, who are the people who are leading us? I mean, very pertinent now, actually, in the UK with the current debacle going on of the inquiry into how the government handled the corona crisis and everyone blaming everyone else. And we're like, well, hang on a minute, weren't you people all in charge? But, you know, what do we expect? These are just ordinary people. There's nothing particularly special about politicians. Well, they're not ordinary people. That would be my point, is that they're aristocratic people. Mm. They're from the highest class in England. They're a very small minority. And Boris Johnson being the exemplar of this, they feel entitled to rule. And that's what this book explores, is that Lord Darlington is a total amateur. He doesn't see the big picture. He's being wound around the little finger of Hitler and his German ambassador. Mm. And that comes up in a conversation between Stevens and this young journalist, who's the godson of Lord Darlington, who crashes this meeting. I did love that. For me, I actually loved that critique of colonialism and aristocratic mindset and I have never read anything that really showed me what it would have been like to live in the 1930s, where fascism was admired by a huge number of people mm. and democracy was seen as irrelevant, mm. uh, again, depressingly relevant to today, perhaps in mm. the United States mm. and elsewhere. The idea of strong men. I thought Ishiguro did that really well. And it gets picked up again, doesn't it, in the discussion in one of the villages where Stevens is talking to the local villagers who think he is an aristocratic gentleman, not a butler. Mm -hmm. And he actually doesn't disabuse them of that fact. He's an interesting character. He's not hugely likable. And yet we're so close to him. We're right in his head. We can see how he is justifying his behavior. And actually, we do know he feels often just because he recounts anecdotes where someone is saying to him, are you all right? Are those tears? Yes. So... I do think this is a wonderful book in many ways. For me, it's just a little bit joyless, the writing. Not even just the experience, but the writing, the tone, all of it. Well, my book club said it's a book of missed moments. And Amanda was saying the problem with Stevens is he never brings any critical thinking to anything. He accepts everything. There's a key element where Lord Darlington tells him that two maids who are employed in the household need to be dismissed yeah. because they're Jewish. And Stevens does it. Miss Kenton protests vociferously and says, I won't stay if they go. If they go, I go. But Stevens is, if Lord Darlington says it must be so, he has his reasons. I'm sure they are good ones. Of course, they must go. You do get really frustrated with him. I think Ishiguro wants you to get frustrated with him. You know, the mm. few books I've read of his, The Unconsoled being the particular one, I think he loves writing frustrating characters. I think he loves making the reader feel frustrated. And I think this is a book where it's very much about how you feel as you read it rather than facts that you take away. It takes you through all these different emotions in a way that's really quite extraordinary, I think, and leaves you reflecting perhaps on your own life, on our own capacity for self-determination, I suppose. And you do sympathise with him because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, he is a butler, you know? <laughs> this is his job to do what he's told, so, you know. <laughs> I liked it a lot, but I did have some problems with it. I didn't think he did enough to convince me of the feeling that existed between Miss Kenton and Stevens. Because on the page, if you literally look at the words on the page, he's awful to her. He is so mean and rude. And I was just like, why would she want to be around this man for a second? But, you know, apparently then they go on to this relationship where she's going into his room for tea at the end of the day. And they're going through evaluating the day and planning the next day together. And you're sort of encouraged to think that their relationship had got quite cozy at this point. There was nothing in there that actually specified any moments where she might have felt more warmly towards him. And in fact, every time they did interact, usually he was just like, it was like having an annoying boss at work. Like, just don't talk to me like that. Like, you know. So I would have liked more than that. And we talked a bit about the way that in a way it felt like it needed a couple of amazing actors to come along and really flesh out those characters, those looks, those emotions that an actor would be able to convey that you just, I felt you didn't get enough of in the words on the page. It just felt a bit clinical for me. But, you know, 
not everyone in my book club agreed. Yes, tell me. Tell me what the book club thought. Everyone gave it really good scores. I think we did all feel it was a really important and worthwhile book that was well done. We all had various things that we weren't sure about and lots of things that we discussed, but overall, everybody gave it four stars or five stars. But Andy H said, is it a little slight? The first time I read it, I did wonder that, even though I enjoyed it. This time around, I felt empathy for Stevens all the way through. It was such a sad thing. He just wanted to be loved, to fit in. And this time he said, I did find it deep. It made me think about politics, about being accountable, and that sadness about not making any kind of stand. So it made me think more than I thought it would. And then he <laughs> says, but it's tricky to extricate it from the film, which I think it is. So Maria, even though she kept falling asleep over it, she said, when I got to the end, there was a sense of having finished a really good book. There's lots you take away to consider how we build our own cage, construct our identity and how our own rules limit us. And she said it was at a time when she was looking after her mother who was unwell. And so she was her main carer. She was looking after her 24 seven. And she said, I was keenly aware of how it is when you're living for someone other than yourself. In the end, I really enjoyed the book. Sally said, it's quite slim, but I feel it's one of those novels, the way that he writes, there's not a spare word. It's such a beautifully clear, precise way of writing. And yet there are all these layers of feeling underneath that that he manages to bring out. I found it an incredibly sad book, but there is also humour there. It's tragic the way that Stevens missed all the opportunities to take anything for himself. The small moments of self-knowledge undermined his whole way of being. I found it heartbreaking, like peeling an onion. And I love the fact that Ishiguro doesn't spell it out for you. There's such a sense of feeling, of atmosphere in his novels. I find very powerful. I just love the way he writes. Mm, lots of people do. And I said, I thought the writing was superb. The clarity, consistency and strength of that distinctive voice was what did it for me. I completely believed in this character and felt I was living it all with him and understanding his very limited perspective on things and feeling a great deal of sadness for him in all of that. I'm not giving it a five because I'm not sure how much I learned from it. I'm not sure it enlarged my worldview at all but I thoroughly enjoyed reading it and it felt like an easy read in a good way. I would agree with that as well. Like, it is an easy read. You fly through it, or I did anyway. Mm, I disagree. I would not say it's a page turner. <laughs> well, no, it's funny. It's not a page turner, but there's equally nothing holding you back. It's, <laughs> I found it kind of a frictionless read. <laughs> you just sort of slide through it. <laughs> Coco, perhaps I should say, was our least high scorer. I didn't find it a page turner. For me, the internal meanderings just went on a bit too long and I just wanted Stevens to get on with it. But I really understood this character. Ishiguro's depiction of the time and the idea of a life in service I thought was very, very good. It's not a criticism, but one of the reasons I didn't enjoy it so much was it didn't feel fresh. It just felt like the same old upstairs, downstairs Do you think, story. though? Because I feel like I haven't really read anything like it. I'm thinking of TV and film. I'm thinking of like Downton Abbey and Gosford Park, which yeah. came after. Yeah. Which came after, definitely. And may well have taken cues from this novel. I really don't know. I feel like that could be a doctoral thesis. Um, it's the interplay of fiction and TV and film and representations of the service folks in these stately homes. But it just, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's just not what I wanted to read. Spend a bit more time with upper class bozos like Boris. It is a melancholy novel, but it does have this way of, you know, uh, we were talking about the title. Many books you read and the title just feels like the logical thing that you would call the book that you just read. With this, once you've read the book, the title becomes so resonant. It's such a perfect title and it really makes you think about life and the time that we have lived and the time that we have left and that very understated, as with all of Ishiguro's writing, I think, you know, this, this sort of understated brilliance. Stuart was saying, I mean, we can't talk too much about the ending, but he just said that for him, he couldn't think of anything else that he'd read like that. The end scene was so devastating. I thought it was genius. And the title, the title was so amazing. <laughs> the significance <laughs> of the title in these last few pages was really, really good. And I agree. I thought the same. I was like, wow, that's a good title. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to read <laughs> well, the book I mean, to really appreciate it. He tees it. it up. He tees it up, doesn't he? It's pretty explicit how the title comes from those final musings. Yeah, but um, the way it's all woven through. Yeah, I would recommend it. Don't you think? I would. Oh, well, I guess, you know, we can only read so many books. Mm. And should this that, be one of them? Should this be one of them? Yeah. Um, and, and, and for all I say, it was a good book club book. It was almost one of those ones where because generally people found it excellent and it is a bit of a kind of one note 
book, I think, in some ways. He's got this one big idea and everything is exploring that one idea. Mm -hmm. And I felt like in terms of the emotional tone, it's very flat or not Mm -hmm. so much flat, but it has one level of intensity and it doesn't really change. And so perhaps that's why Andy was feeling it was a bit thin. We're going to come on to talk about our recommendations. And I was thinking about Virginia Woolf. And I was just thinking about Virginia Woolf's writing compared to Ishiguro's. And I feel like there are so many more layers in Virginia Woolf's writing than there are in this. It's not fair to compare one writer to another like this, but it's just interesting because then it helps you identify, well, what is it about this that I'm feeling like I'm missing? You know, what's not there? And it was that. I think it comes back to that control as well, because Virginia Woolf is a very joyful writer. I feel like her prose has a certain (laughs) joy to it. She's classically, famously, incredibly depressed. (laughs) Her prose, her prose, right? Like there's an energy and a vibrancy. Whereas Ishiguro in real life, if you ever hear him speak, he is actually very jolly. (laughs) So (laughs) maybe there's a lesson in there. Um, Okay, but just before we get to our recommendations, we need to wrap this up. So is it a good book club book? We can't quite decide. (laughs) <laughs> well, that's something because usually, listeners, if this is your first episode, spoiler, but usually we're pretty clear if something is a good book club book. And most of the time, they are. I don't know. Certainly, I wouldn't be recommending it to my book club. It's a funny one because normally I'd say yes, yes, because we all gave it such high scores. Like everyone gave it four or five stars out of five. But it didn't prompt great debate. And a few weeks on from reading it... It's interesting what Hannah said, you know, I didn't really feel like it widened my worldview. I didn't take that much away from it. And I guess for book club, you quite like it to be something where you perhaps come away thinking slightly differently about something or, you know, the reason we read this is because there was so much publicity about the latest one, Clara and the Sun. And my book club don't like to read brand new hardbacks because they're expensive. So we thought, well, we'll go back and read Rose of the Day. But it sort of makes me want to read Clara and the Sun. I'm interested to see if this is what he was writing then. What's he writing now? I'm interested in that. Mm, And I think if you haven't ever read any Ishiguro, I think this is great. This and Never Let Me Go, either one of those. Because he is a really, really, really interesting and wonderful writer. But yes, maybe not an essential book club read. I feel like we're loud laboring this point too much. I'm going to go spend worrying about, was it good for book club? When we did The Memory Please by Yoko Ogawa, I had a very clear sense of how even though I didn't enjoy reading it that much I just thought it's such a good book club book there are so many things Mm -hmm. that just fun for a book club to really dig into I don't have that same sense with this I thought it was a really interesting worthwhile read and wonderful to read this writer and his work but yeah in terms of discussion it wasn't one of our sparkiest debates shall we say and I'm not Mm. sure any of us came away with that much having read this I also think it's a real classic case of the way you see things. Some people, and I am one of these people, do have a tendency to go around saying, oh, if only I'd done this. And my husband just laughs at me. He's like, well, what's life without regret? He says, because he's the opposite. He's not someone who ever thinks back to, oh, the path's not taken or dwells on that kind of thing. That's not his natural cast of the way he thinks about things. And I think there's something in that as well. It sort of slightly depends what kind of person you are, how you're going to respond to this book. You might just want to give him a good shake like Coco did, Mm. I'd say, oh, for goodness Mm -hmm. sake. (laughs) Or you might very much be like, yes, yes, if only you had done this. And and if you'd said something else at that point, but no, I just, you know. Said anything. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Acted like a normal human being at any point. Well, it's interesting that his latest book's about robot, of course. I know, yes. Could you argue that. that that's the natural evolution of Stevens, a human butler with all his emotions so tamped down that he is never able to express a personal thought? to Clara the robot. And on that note, I don't think there's anything more to be said, do you? No. (laughs) Inspired by the remains of the day, here are some more recommendations for your next book club book. I find there's a slightly hard one to think of obvious following. I was like, oh, other books about butlering? We talked in book club about the Jeeves and Worcester books. And if you want to read a book Mm. about a jolly butler, although then there was a discussion about he's not actually a butler of Jeeves. We think he was a valet, which is a different different thing. That's true. And the Um, valets tend to be a lot more fun, don't they? Yeah. (laughs) They're like the fun counterpart to the butler. So there's that. But yeah, staying on the slightly melancholy theme, I had a think and I asked my book club as well. And we came up with the McEwen, Ian McEwen book on Chesil Beach. Have you ever read that? Ugh. Yes. Yeah, interesting. You same, but you know, book club. So it's a novella. 
So it's always quite sure. nice to read something that if you're not enjoying it, you can get through it quickly. Why have we have both have these versions? Like, people love this book. And then they made a film of it. Do like, they? Loads of people really? must love it. Oh, it's awful. Okay, but it okay. is very, yep, it is a very perfect fit for this one. It's all about repressed English love. In the summer of 1962, Edward and Florence, young innocents married that morning, arrive in a hotel on the Dorset coast. At dinner in their rooms, they struggle to suppress their private fears of the wedding night to come. And unbeknownst to them both, the events of the evening will haunt them for the rest of their lives. We can tell people, can't we? It does not go well. It's night of passion. <laughs> the story is told by Edward, who is thinking back to Florence again and of the night they separated, wondering what would have happened if things had turned out differently. He muses that one's life can be changed simply by doing nothing. Florence had loved him deeply as they left each other and wanted nothing more than for him to call out for her, at which she would have turned back to reconcile. So the book has been called A Masterpiece of Miscommunication and Mistaken Intent. I did do it for book club. I think my book club before my current book club did it. I have to say I found it one of the most infuriating books I've ever read. <laughs> my main reaction to it was, oh, for goodness sake. But many people do love it. And it's Ian McEwan. It's, it, it is beautifully written. And I think it's quite a good reaction book. It's going to provoke different reactions in people. And that's always quite good for book club. Yeah, I'm with you. I think that would be a much better book club book than The Remains of the Day. <laughs> I mean, I hated it, but I would love to thrash that out with someone who loved it. Chesil Beach, for anyone who's not from the UK, is a really interesting beach. It's all shingle. It's all pebbles. And it's being graded by nature in that the waves have sorted the pebbles so that at one end of this very very long beach it's a sort of great bank and it stretches on for what seems like forever at one end the stones are large and then pleasingly for someone like me a graphic designer we like things to be organized the more you go down the beach the smaller and smaller and smaller they get till the other end when they're all very small and there is something really magnetic about it. Anyway, just thought I should explain. That's Chesil Beach. I was also thinking about, as I mentioned earlier, Virginia Woolf, Mrs. Dalloway. I was thinking you've got a main protagonist who's reflecting back on her life, but also it's got that thing of the events of a day. I love this book. I did it for A-levels. So it's one of my like mm. formative reads, you know, what a lark, mm -hmm. what a plunge. So Clarissa Dalloway is preparing for a party. She is married to quite an eminent politician. And as she's going through these party preparations, she is musing back on an old possible romance that didn't work out. Certain choices were made and reflecting back on the friends of her youth and the choices that left her where she is. Also, I was listening to Deborah Levy talking at the Hay Festival the other day, and she was talking about she is doing an event for the Royal Society of Literature. They do a Dalloway Day and she's doing that and listening to her talk about Wolf. I loved it. it, made me want to read it again. She was talking about just the way it's written and the way that the objects carry the story and they carry the writer's arguments. So everything from a bunch of flowers to a car that Mrs. Dalloway sees gliding through the streets, it all feeds into this story. And I thought, yeah, there was something of that also, I think, in The Remains of the Day that I liked. And I also thought To the Lighthouse, which I read quite recently, which I think is quite a challenge. Well, I certainly found it quite a challenging read. And I was thinking, well, that's quite good for book club sometimes because it's one of those books where actually that bit of a nudge of book club making you do it will make you knuckle down to it slightly. But it's so rewarding. I absolutely loved it. And again, looking at themes of memory and regret and childhood innocence and the way that life moves on and you can't go back. Things change. I'm a loved big it. wolf fan as well. It's so good. It's not an easy read, but it's so, so, no. so good. I'm going to throw a recommendation in here. Coming back to Ian McEwan, I think I have recommended this in the past, but his short novella Amsterdam. Oh, yeah. Which is about so two depressing, Laura. Oh, my God. friends and rivals. It's not depressing. People say it's depressing. It wasn't an I've American it. reviewer when we discussed it in the past. An American deeply, reviewer was talking deeply about it. It's a depressing book. But it's not. It's a farce, really. It's about two rivals, two friends in their, I think, late 60s, maybe even early 70s, who make a sort of pact that they won't let the other one go downhill mentally. So they sort of make a death pact, effectively, for euthanasia. And anyway, it kind of goes on from there. But it is about looking back and regrets. And they were rivals for one woman's attention. Actually, she chose someone else. And what does that mean? It's also very English. And so it feels like it fits here, too. It's livelier than Chessel Beach. Mm. So, you know, you could choose your McEwen, choose your poison. And finally, Sally in my book club recommended a book called Staying On by Paul Scott. Oh, I've never heard of that. He wrote The Raj Quartet. 
Tusker and Lily Smully stayed on in India. Given the chance to return home when Tusker, once a colonel in the British Army, retired, they chose instead to remain in the small hill town of Pankot, with its eccentric inhabitants and archaic rituals left over from the days of the Empire. Only the tyranny of their landlady, the imposing Mrs. Boulaboy, threatens to upset the quiet rhythm of their days. Both funny and deeply moving, staying on is a unique, engrossing portrait of the end of an empire and of a 40-year love affair. Sally says it's about looking back on a life from old age, dealing with themes of class and empire and frustration and regret. And she also says that if it inspires people to go on and read the Raj Quartet, it'll all be worthwhile. Ooh, okay. I thought that sounded right. good, actually. Yeah, I think that sounds the best of all that the lot, I, That's the one I want to read. <laughs> <laughs> and the Raj Quartet sounds promising, too. I love a quartet. Yeah, so those are our recommendations. And hopefully there will be something in there for your next book club read. That's almost it for this episode. Our book recommendations were Mrs. Dalloway and To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf, Amsterdam and On Chesil Beach by Ian McEwan, and Staying On by Paul Scott. Our next show is our 2021 Women's Prize podcast. We're going to be joined by previous podcast guests Elizabeth Morris and Sarah Oliver to discuss and debate every one of the six shortlisted titles. We've been reading for weeks and having to keep our thoughts to ourselves. Finally, we'll get to air them. Will we manage to pick the winner? Which one do you think should win? Listen in to see if we agree. In the meantime, don't miss our recent interview with Chrissy Ryan of New North London Bookshop and Bar, Book Bar. As well as hearing all about Chrissy's plans for her space to read, drink and be merry, she also gives us a ton of brilliant book recommendations from her current favourites to those not to miss coming out soon. If you enjoyed the show, do visit our website, thebookclubreview.co.uk, where you can browse through our archives of over 80 episodes alongside articles, reviews and recommendations. If you want to hear more from us, don't miss our weekly newsletter. It comes out on Sundays and has reviews and links to things we love. It's full of bookish inspiration for the week ahead. You can sign up via the link in the show notes on our website or via our Instagram bio. If you'd like to see what we're up to between episodes, follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or you can email us at thebookclubreview at gmail.com. And if you're not already, why not subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts? If you like what we do, please do take a moment to rate and review the show and help other listeners find us. But for now, that's our show. Thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>